So hello everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Zane Diamond and I have been thinking about meditation for quite some time in my career. Um, what I wanted to do today was to talk a little bit about meditation from the point of view of making a link between um, the wisdom traditions within the Indigenous world and then the wisdom traditions within the Asian world um, looking at the legacy of how we in Australia might um, inherit uh, this concept of meditation and what it means in the context of the West. I use that in inverted commas. Now, you'll see from this photo that uh, there, there's, I, I see there, there being some, um, some links, obviously, between the meditation that was proposed through um, things like Hinduism. Um, as it's come to us in its various forms from the Urgveda, from the Upanishads. Uh, when we look at the teachings of Zarasta, when, when with the Avesta, we have um, examples. When I listen to the oral traditions of indigenous peoples, um, clearly the, the concept of uh, meditation is common amongst humans. And I think that that's an important point to make so that it's not a particular, um, it's not a particular thing that might be able to be carved off by any particular um, tradition, although obviously different um, civilizations and different human societies have used what we call meditation in various ways uh, for various reasons. So what I wanted to do today uh, was walk you through some of the thinking um, that I've been doing in over the last many years, actually thinking about this and seeing what lands for you in terms of uh, you know, the interest that you have uh, in, in meditation um, through Meditation Australia. Now, first of all, of course, I need to um, pay gratitude to my teachers. Uh, you'll see here that I've been taught by many people about many things. This is um, of, of, of interest to us today. Uh, on the left, you see uh, a woman who is a traditional owner of, a, um, of the lands around the Argyle Diamond Mine. Um, now she's teaching her young grandson here, but she's doing a ritual which involves a lot of um, a sense of stillness and connection and, um, and, and, and calm, deep listening. And it's a common practice in the Aboriginal world, of course, this concept of listening that... Uh, we're often accused of not doing very well as non-Indigenous people. On the right-hand side, we have um, Nawit, um, Dr. Carolyn Briggs. Uh, she's the traditional elder of the Boon people of the Kulin Nations on the land where I am living and working. And, you know, I pay my respects to Indigenous people past and present in this talk um, for the ancestral wisdom, for the, the teachings that people pass on. I'd also pay my respects to the people, two people in the middle. Um, the top is um, my teacher, Ayakima Bikuni. So I, I am authorized to teach within her tradition and she taught me um, many, many things about how to teach. It's not simply, of course, about doing. And that's partly the role that Meditation Australia, of course, will play a big role in hopefully into the future. It's not simply how to meditate, but how to teach people to meditate. And this is, I think, an art that needs um, much sharper focus than maybe it's being given. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about that topic. And then the person in the bottom and the middle is um, Professor Bob Teasdale. And I pay my deep gratitude to him because he set me on the academic path and gave me the permission, I think, oh gosh, too many years ago to mention now, but in the early 90s, so 30, at least 30 years ago, he, I talked to him about being fascinated by this concept of wisdom and what it entailed and, and how I felt that we needed to start remembering some of our wisdom traditions within mainstream schooling that we'd sort of maybe lost during the industrialization of education. So these four slide, these four photos sort of give a, an entree into the way that I want to approach this today as a sort of bridge between um, Indigenous cultures and their traditions of um, meditation, the traditions through Asia, and then of course now into its um, period of uh, finding fertile soil here in Australia, countries like Australia. 
So what is wisdom? So when I'm educating for wisdom, of which med meditation is a key part, I'll just take my camera off for a little bit so that you can see wisdom emerges as an outcome for me. Um, it's not something that one gets. It's not like an object. So how do you educate for wisdom is not so much educating for wisdom as educating for the things that sit around wisdom that may support its emergence. So I see wisdom as an emerging thing, but I see wisdom itself is an outcome of a metaphysical articulation of ideas developed by following a pedagogical pathway, becoming embodied in individuals within the social resonance of specific localities. So Buddhism, for example, still retains a pedagogical pathway to developing wisdom. And that's, I suppose, the pathway that I've concentrated most on, and it's the tradition within which I have the permission to teach. Even so, it is not an exclusive domain. There are, of course, other human societies and, and other humans who have pursued and discovered and embedded and practiced and taught the same techniques or similar techniques within different cultural domains. Now, important for education, ed academics and teachers can actually learn such pedagogical pathways that lead to the cultivation of wisdom. We see it's across civilizations. I, I imagine that um, the people listening to this, you come from many different ethnic cultural backgrounds. You have ancestors from across the world, across the globe and throughout civilizations, I'd imagine. And you'll see here that there's a very healthy expression of this concept of wisdom in language uh, across many, 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 many languages. Um, those hopefully you will speak and um, if you don't speak, those, then you may want you may see something that you recognise here in uh, in other languages, and uh, it's an important thing to remember that it's uh, the notion of meditation is often couched within these concepts of self development and wisdom and all of these sort of more metaphysical or uh, yeah metaphysical concepts that um, aren't really to do with the day to day mundane world, but which the mundane world probably could arguably desperately need at the moment to, to get a bit of sanity back in. So one of the things that I'd make the point of saying is that uh, quietness of the mind is a common feature of all wisdom paths. So this quietness of the mind, it, it's, it's this sort of sense of what the Buddhists call calm abiding or stillness or tranquility quietude. We have a lot of words. I'm going to focus from the wisdom pathway more broadly, and I'll come back to this, down to this common feature of one of the aspects of the cultivation of wisdom needs to be the capacity to go inward, that it's not simply a performance, um, a performativity that happens for people, or a, a sense of, uh, a sense of, um, you know, external, um, you know, external agitation and uh, a noise that keeps us from listening to our true inner nature. Neither is it cognitive. Uh, there's cognitive aspects after, but the practice of meditation is itself uh, um, what we call a, some, in Buddhism, we call a samadhi practice. But it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's this quietness of mind that is sort of lacking in a lot of different cultures, my research has shown. It's not simply the West that's noisy. I think everybody, you know, the coffee culture, if you can sort of think about coffee culture, how it keeps our minds sort of agitated and constantly reflecting on the external and the cognitive instead of coming into that sort of calm, reflective, quiet. Um, it's not the epistemological, it's not the stories we tell anymore. It's about, um, it's more the deep, the sort of, um, what I call the subconscious or, the, or what people call the subconscious, I sort of more call the liminal mind or the, the reptilian mind that sits and goes within. So this is a common feature of all the wisdom pathways that I've examined over many, many years. So I think it's an important thing that Meditation Australia is doing to offer the opportunity to, to, for people to learn these quietnesses of mind. Now, the concept of meditation for example, within Buddha Dharma, I'm giving the examples from Buddhism because I think we owe a debt of legacy, a legacy debt to Gautama Buddha for the way he formalized this in a very clear and followable way. But I, I certainly um, reflect on, you know, as we know, the indigenous traditions um, have this stillness and deep listening that uh, Miriam Ungbar Rose has, um, has obviously made so, so, um, accessible to us through the concept in her language of Dadiri. But what we see here is a movement of heartland Buddhism where Buddha was actually teaching 
um, the calmness of mind as a, as a series of practices on the path to understanding and how it gets to a little Buddhist school that I'm working with. Um, it's a school that is uh, influenced. It's a, it's a mainstream school in Australia, but it, is, uh, it follows the philosophical pathway of what we call Buddha Dharma or the Buddha's way of uh, teaching. And so you've got these expressions of meditation and Buddha Dharma that go all the way from Bodh Gaya in the north east of India um, through its expansion into Asia, um, which has a whole lot of different manifestations depending on whether it became part of the Theravada school or the Mahayana school or the, uh, the Zen school when it gets to Japan or when it gets up into Tibet and it, um, it, it, it becomes a very powerful expression of um, there's Vajrayana that comes out of that area. What you've got is a whole lot of traditions of um, expression of Buddhism that are now, of course, coming to the West in a place like Dalesford, where you'd see, what I'd say is that what you're seeing is meditation practices um, that are coming out of that Buddhist tradition or a Hindu tradition or a Vesta of the Zoroastrian tradition or of Islam or of Judaism, of all the ancient religions, all have these um, practices of Christianity. It has its practices of meditation and quietude. How all of these practices end up coming from where they were developed, coming through a process of transformation. And then also now we see as with Buddhism, we're into a third manifestation in a country like Australia, which is such an immigrant population overlaying the indigenous where you're getting these teachings coming from places like Asia, making uh, now sort of emerging with Australian characteristics, if you like. So the next slide um, is sort of, I'll, I'll just locate it a little bit um, in terms of the theoretical conceptual work, where we're talking about like what meditation might look like across time and place. And as I've said, I think that we owe an enormous amount of um, gratitude to the work that was done by the early, um, Urgveda Upanishadic traditions and then moving into the Jain, the Jain tradition and also of course the Buddhist tradition about which I'm talking most specifically today. So what you're seeing is um, I'm using an international and comparative perspective in the education. So I'm, I'm proposing that meditation needs to be thought of as an education exercise when we're trying to teach it. So there's a whole lot we know from wisdom studies, we know from indigenous studies, Buddhist studies, and within the sociology of knowledge. And I draw on all of these streams of, in, of, of thinking flow into what we do in pre-service teacher education and what I do in teacher education. So I've had the privilege of being at places like Nalanda, where it was a huge university of, of thinking, which talked on a daily basis. You could go to a lecture on meditation and discussions about meditation techniques and practices and the, all the metaphysical uh, discussions that happened and the commentaries that happened around meditation at Nalanda. You could just go every day. Um, there was hundreds and hundreds of lectures being conducted across this complex on a daily basis. Um, it was a very exciting place, I'd imagine, to have been, and it was influenced in many, many people in many parts of Asia as they travelled out from Nalanda, as we saw in the previous map. I'll just show you, if I go back to the Nalanda map, Nalanda is here, and you can see it's the epicentre. So the Buddhist teaching was this red bit here. And then what you see is this Nalanda University, which is just here, becoming the epicentre of movement of ideas very, through various epoch of coming down into Sri Lanka and then from Sri Lanka being shared across into um, Siam as it was called, which is of course now um, Thailand. And then you also have it moving out across through into China and then into Japan. You have it moving from Nalanda around through India and coming up through um, the Middle East and indeed up into what was um, some of the Greek held territory and going over and into Lhasa. So you've got two sorts of treks of um, Buddhism coming up into Mongolia through Lhasa. And you've, then you've got this long way round that went through Lhasa also, and then just came down into other manifestations. So what you've got is this really interesting flow of ideas about meditation that comes from places like the ancient Nalanda University until I find myself teaching a group of teachers um, at, a, at a Buddhist temple complex that's in Bendigo now. Um, and, and you find this statue of the Buddha sitting in the Australian bush, obviously still meditating, still with this very, very peaceful, um, calm, 
uh, satisfied sort of demeanor of someone who has a concept of their internal world. So what happens is that we move towards um, a research approach. I will move through this quickly because, but I thought for some of you might be interested that it's actually the works I've been doing, uh, I've been doing about the past 25 years. Um, wondering how these sorts of ideas about meditation and the development of wisdom get translated into formal schooling, how the ideas of a, of a, of a school of thought like the Buddha Dharma are communicated within schools and what's the impact of you know, Buddhist philosophy on the culture of the school, on teaching. And, and, and of course, the, the big question is how useful is this for bringing into modern education? Now, um, of course, Meditation Australia is to some degree working uh, with, um, with clients, and so it's outside the formal schooling structure, but it is actually still an educative sort of approach when we're teaching people how to meditate. So there are some things that are being learned that can be used by both formal and informal education systems, and certainly in things like teacher professional development and in the professional development of meditation teachers particularly. So again, um, what I'm looking at is how the cultivation of wisdom can be put into the modern formal education system. So making a translation of these old ideas. Um, I was privileged to be able to sit under the Bodhi tree that was one of the, uh, it's one of the ancestors of the original Bodhi, Gaya, Bodhi tree that the Buddha was, became enlightened under at Bodh Gaya. And I have also had the privilege of meeting the new academics that had doing the new teachings at the new Nalanda University that's been set up that Australia actually is um, um, supporting financially. So it, it all ends up coming back to the same thing, I think. So not only was meditation key to it and this sense of quietude, but also a notion of finding balance. So on the left, you'll see this is the cave where the Buddha spent a lot of his time uh, meditating during rains retreats and things like that. And um, he, he would just live in that cave and it probably hasn't changed much in the two and a half thousand years since he was there it was certainly a, it's a very powerful place quite beautiful uh at a place called um vultures peak and uh again i was very privileged to spend some time there and and amazingly uh i was able to spend time there when nobody else was there which was um apparently quite rare I had about an hour and a half there with nobody else came anywhere near the place. So it was an extraordinarily quiet, peaceful, powerful um, place to just be still for a, you know an hour and a half. Um, but I've also, uh, also had a lot of uh, discussions with uh, Buddhist monks and nuns and also lay teachers of, of meditation, how, how the best way is to actually do this. Like what's the pedagogy that sits behind this that's really effective for people? And uh, these are questions that obviously I'm talking to you about today, but it often comes out of a legacy of uh, thinking about, you know, Indigenous and the traditional knowledges that were right across Asia that we now are the benefactors of, I suppose, we get the benefit of um, at, at the end in Australia, where we're given the opportunity to learn these things anew uh, within our lifetimes. Obviously, it comes from um, a very old curriculum of the Noble Eightfold Path that some of you might be familiar with. So how one uses meditation, obviously the, the main one here is right concentration, that is to practice meditation. And that in itself is one of the conditions of what we call the Noble Eightfold Path. But right concentration also helps all of the others. You'll notice mindfulness is another big aspect of this. And what they say in, uh, what, we, what we say in Buddhism is that Right concentration is one wing of the bird and mindfulness is the other. And so what happens is if you have meditation and mindfulness or vipassana, then what you can, you're can you able to do is to actually really strengthen your ability in this to get a, a balance between those two things. But right mindfulness and right concentration of meditation actually helps to the develop right view, right intention, right speech, right action, and right livelihood and right effort. They all support one another. And uh, this concept of balance is incredibly important. And I'll just move to the next slide, which will show you a little bit more about what I'm thinking about that. So we have here, um, the Buddha's pedagogical approach to teaching and learning was by skillful means. And I like this idea of the balancing of the three legs of the pot. Um, the skillful means is what we're really talking about when we're talking about pedagogy, um, how we actually teach and learn 
in the space about meditation. And we've got an enormous amount of wisdom and legacy coming to us from, as I said, the indigenous and um, Asian spaces. Now, this is probably the best map I can give you to understand the cultivation of wisdom and what we're talking about here. Um, you've, also, you've got all this worldly wisdom that comes out of outsider knowledge, school and university knowledge, development, local knowledge, indigenous knowledges, come into this concept of worldly wisdom. All of those traditions also have aspects of transcendental knowledge, which leads to higher wisdom. Either way, the, the, the goal of this is either worldly wisdom or higher wisdom, or for most people, both. Here I see the pot of wisdom. This is the emergence space. So you fill this up through balancing the practices of these three legs. So what you have first is the concept of sila or religious, moral, ethical knowledges. Now these would be familiar domains, but just doesn't matter what religious tradition you come from or what spiritual tradition. It's the idea is that you have to balance things so that you're not just doing the one, you're trying to balance all three. Here in the Buddhist, um, in the Buddhist, in the in the Pali, you're, it's called sila. And this, I think, is the axiological domain. So when in the West we talk about the affective, the moral, the ethical, the axiological, this is the development of this concept called the religious, moral, and ethical knowledges in a person. So this is part of the pedagogical approach is the development of this aspect. I'll go to this side, and this is the Vipassana one that I mentioned before. This is Vipassana in the Pali, which is the, the epistemological domain. This is the cognitive domain of insight, understanding, of analysis, of science. And every society has scientific knowledge or evidence-based knowledge. So what we have is these two legs of the pot I'm not going to deal so directly with, although they're both still very important when cultivating um, wisdom. But the key one for the purposes of meditation is the middle one. This is this one of the ontological domain, which I'm, which is it's almost, it's inaccessible cognitively almost. It has to be done inwardly and it has to be still and it has to be quiet. So it's about this idea of concentration, of calm abiding, of absorption knowledges. So the, the, you'll hear words like, quietness or reflection or inwardness but I suppose one of the things that I've found with studying all of these traditions is there's a pathway that is taught by someone to someone else and it's given knowledge it's knowledge that's given from someone who's experienced it who knows how to teach it who knows the pathway who's a reliable guide who then teaches um, some aspect of Two, there's two aspects really to this. There's the awareness practices that are often associated with mindfulness. And they are, they're a set of important, incredibly important practices where one is meditatively aware of what one is doing with one's body, one's emotions, one's feelings, one's thoughts, one's senses. Um, and then there is this notion of a single pointed awareness in meditation that one can actually come to. And again, you hear this in many traditions, but in the Buddhist, in the Pali, it's called Ekagata. And you bring the mind into a still point. Um, Mark Link um, talks about it in the Christian religion as this still point in the turning world. So one practices and practices and cultivates awareness to the point of single pointed awareness. And then there are a series of practices which are more about absorption. So one that absorbs into the meditative stillness and quietness. And in the Buddhist, these are called the jhanas, but they're in many other traditions. They are called you know, other things, but, but of the same. The, the, the human mind goes to these places if trained. I just know the Buddhist pathway because it's something that I followed. So I speak most confidently about it and I have the, most, uh, I have the, uh, the permission to teach it, but I have experienced it in other, uh, other domains as well. And it's pretty well the same place it's different pathways to the same place which is this sense of absorption now from the sense of absorption comes this arising of deepening the understanding of things as they really are and so the mindfulness that one comes out of this with is a much sharper awareness of the nature of reality which then helps to for one to live uh, more mindfully in a moral and ethical um, sense so all of them are associated with one another and eventually in the balance of these things one then um, is able to um, cultivate an emergence of uh, what we call wisdom. So that's the sort of, that, that's where for me, um, uh, we, meditation actually sits within what I would see as this ontological domain and how it's taught. 
And this comes from, you know, this comes from, you know, all these spiritual traditions. Now I'll talk particularly about the Buddhist one here again, because this is where I have done most of my work. So there are enduring elements of this pedagogy that uh, and curriculum that have been transferable, that are transferable across time and space. So you've seen it come out of Nalanda, go through the various aspects of transformation through Asia um, and into places like Australia. And clearly um, the, the common curriculum elements are the same Vinaya, so there's the same uh, there's the same rules for monks and nuns, which is called the Vinaya. There's the same five precepts. There's this four number truths. There's the Noble Eightfold Path. And there's the using of the scriptures of the Buddhist canon. So, and you'll see these common elements in the curriculum for all spiritual traditions that have a pathway um, where meditation sits. And then uh, what you have is um, a holistic approach that balances the development of sila, um, the ethical, Vipassana, that insight, critical thinking, and samadhi, which are the concentration, absorption practices that I was speaking about. The importance of finding balance between wisdom and compassion, these two wings of the bird I was speaking about, and the use of experiential learning that leads to insight understanding. So without the calm, it's very hard to get the insight to arise. But my teacher, Ayakimi, used to say a little, bring, little bit of calm brings a little bit of insight. A little bit of insight brings a little bit of calm. And so there's this, this relationship between calm and insight that's important to cultivate. And it uses a number of techniques, such as memorization of texts, um, use of numbers to aid the memory, use of similes, use of oral transition by the teacher. And there's a question and answer format. So there's a lot of familiar pedagogies in teaching someone how to meditate uh, that are still with us and we can still access. So this shows a little bit about um, where this sits within the overall approach of the middle way through the steps of training. And I'm particularly looking at pedagogy, as you can see today. And so where does this come? You see this pedagogy here. It goes down into three aspects. So firstly, one learns how to meditate, the notions of pariyati or how to meditate, the techniques of either awareness practices, ekagata or single pointed awareness practices or the practices of the jhanas or the absorptions. Once you've done the learning with the teacher, you then have to go into a period of patipati, which is practicing. This is this piece down here, the practicing of the Dharma, the practicing of these teachings. So if you're giving a teaching about meditation, you teach someone how to do it, you give them a chance to go off and experience it. You may in the class, if you're running a class, experience, give an experiential um, experiential opportunity for the student and then there's an expectation that the student goes off and actually practices um, and practices this and this is a technique that's been used across Asia for centuries of course so that they learn from a teacher then they go off and practice by themselves and then this third part which is the Pativeda which is then coming out of that practice and develop, thinking about it and developing a deeper understanding coming from that practice so it's not simply about meditation for meditation's sake um, it can be but there are so many more possibilities that one, if one can actually use the meditative experience in the Buddhist sense, one then moves into a process of deepening understanding um, about the nature of reality. And then one comes back into a period of learning. So it's almost, if you can think about um, that spiral that we sometimes shown in uh, organizational development literature of that spiral of learning where you go through a process of learning and then you go and learn again but it's at a different it's a sort of you come back to the same place but you've got more experiential understanding and then you go to another place and you've got a more experiential understanding and ultimately you move up in a spiralic sort of way so it's much more spiralic than linear and it comes back and back and back and you know you sort of I still this still happens to me where I I'm doing a, some sort of a calm practice or an absorption practice and then an aspect of, of the teaching comes back to me and I have a, a deeper understanding of it. And all the time, one is cultivating the possibility for the emergence of wisdom. And as I said, these traditions are traditions that have been taught you know, for at least two and a half thousand years. And in some cases in the Aboriginal world um, have been practices that have been passed on for um, you know, 40,000, 60,000 years in some cases, so before, well before the, the last ice age. So these are human activities that the human mind does. I must emphasize that this is not about um, a particular, that you've got to be a Buddhist to do this. All I know is that um, at the moment, it's one of the reliable pathways that we still have access to, although um, some may have other pathways that are equally effective. If the outcome is to cultivate wisdom, 
meditation is always going to be part of that mix as far as I have learned so far. Now, the second proposition is a little bit more interesting that there are elements of these teachings that have undertaken a process of adaptation or what I call adaptive balancing when they come to new places. So you've got this fabulous little statue. I had to sort of put it in for you where you've got this wonderful, wonderful um, the, the Sanskrit um, a mantra being written on the side of a kangaroo with a joey. So it really summed up for me that uh, this process of adaptive balancing, that um, these ancient traditions and ancient uh, teachings uh, about meditation and about the cultivation of wisdom find fertile soil in new geolocations and there they have to start a process of adaptation. And so what happens is you're starting to see like Meditation Australia, is a Western approach. So it's adopting aspects of Buddhism, obviously, because meditation was so much part of the Buddha's teachings and many, many of the people um, who are Westerners went to Asia and learnt how to meditate through Buddhism. So it's had been an enormous boon to us in Australia that there are so many um, Buddhists who've actually been to the West, uh, have gone to the East in their time, um, we've got parents, a lot of the parents at the school that I work with, um, they want their children to have this sort of education, and they, but they wanted it within Australian context. They obviously know that they're Australian, um, and they're not Asian by background. They're by ethnicity and by religious upbringing, probably mostly from England or Scotland or Wales or some from, um, from a lot from Ireland, for example, but they'd gone to Asia and they'd learnt Buddhism, learnt how to meditate, Found, found it fabulous and wanted to bring it back and their kids to learn it. So it's not necessarily a Buddhism Buddhism that an Asian person would necessarily even recognize. Buddhists who've migrated to Australia are also coming from myriad Asian countries and they stay very close to the way that the Buddhist education was done in their home country. So you've got temples and you've got ways of teaching and you've got an emerging practice of schools being developed that's coming where you'll see um, children being educated in the Australian system, but within like a, it's almost like a religious education, like you have with the Catholic system or the system with the Muslim schools and the, um, that you've got the, this teaching of Islam or Christianity or Catholicism or Buddhism, and you've got schools attached to it. They're using mainstream Australian curriculum, the Australian curriculum and the Australian professional standards for teachers, et cetera. But they're also teaching um, the basic tenets of that particular what we would call religion. But you've also got an emerging form of Buddhist education in temples and schools that's actually adapted to Australian culture. So it's like Buddhism with Australian characteristics. And Meditation Australia is one of these ideal examples of what's happening where people have learned to meditate, but they don't have a particular spiritual or religious tradition that, that they're sitting within. And it, there are, but there are things that we can actually learn from people who've been trained in these ways of doing things, as I have, um, that we can actually learn how to ensure that the processes of meditation that we're teaching are actually reliably giving people the effect that we were able to get by being taught the way we were taught. So I know that there are reliable pedagogies to help people to get to awareness. I know there are reliable pedagogies to get people to that process of single pointed awareness. And I know there are um, pedagogies to enter, to help people enter into the absorptions and the jhanas. And I have been taught how to teach all of those things. And there is a tradition of teaching. It's not so clearly understood in the West. And I think maybe I find that, you know, that when I talk to, when I interview people here who are teaching meditation, um, who haven't come from a, a tradition um, of being trained by within a tradition, that it's a bit more of um, um, a bit of this and a bit of that that's come from maybe um, searching the internet or maybe doing a course or maybe picking up a couple of different trainings and putting it together with what works. And so it's a sort of very dynamic space at the moment of what is meditation, how is it taught and what is taught that I think that um, Meditation Australia is going to make an enormous contribution to in terms of the conversation about that um, for sure. So how do we bring a concept like wisdom back into modern education um, and meditation itself? Um, we have to pay a great debt of gratitude to Indigenous peoples and to the peop various traditions in Asia. Um, we have to recognise that there's people who think that the way that we're doing things in the West is um, 
um, you know, pretty, pretty simplified and, you know, not really uh, capturing the whole essence. I think there's going to be a lot of conversations between between people about, you know, the proper way and should there be a proper way. But I do see that there's a, there's certainly a, a sense of meditation practices that are be emerging as a as more of a, you know, meditation with Australian or Western characteristics that works for people who've been educated within the modern um, sort of form of formal schooling and education, and then come to adulthood and feel that they need something more, that something's missing. So my question, I suppose, is how to bring wisdom back into modern education. And I suppose that what I realise is that meditation is a real key for this, because like, as it says in the Samyutta Nikaya, when a wise one established well in virtue, develops consciousness and understanding one succeeds in disentangling this tangle and you can see here the elements of the pot established in virtue which is the sila or the moral ethical develops consciousness which is the a consciousness that comes from meditation that comes from a concentration that comes from awareness that comes from absorption then moves into an understanding which is the vipassana which is the insight part of the practice you can see this pot sits within this quote when a wise one established well in virtue develops consciousness and understanding balancing one succeeds in disentangling this tangle and I think that that's where the emergence of wisdom actually starts and ends so I see meditation as a, a hugely important key and one that sadly in any in many of the cultures that I'm being exposed to is being lost to this noise of and pace I think maybe with COVID-19, we came back to a little bit more quiet and inward reflection. And I suspect that people found more access to their inner selves, but maybe didn't have the tools to really sit with themselves. And I think this concept of sitting with oneself that is so much part of the techniques that meditation can help to support that one gets to know oneself internally and one then becomes a much more um, a much more satisfied and sane sort of human being. So thank you for your time. I hope you found it interesting and I look forward to future discussions in this space. So I'll finish this by just um, suggesting that we all seek wisdom. And I just wanted to, in the final uh, slide just to acknowledge the work of um, my teachers and uh, all the people who've helped me. I've received an enormous amount of support and encouragement for this work um, from the Australian government and from um, colleagues in places in Japan. I've received an enormous amount of financial support from, um, from sponsors uh, looking at this, um, it, how, how Theravadan Buddhism ends up in teacher education in Thailand and Australia. But there's also all the monks, nuns, lay teachers, educators who've been willing to be involved in this research to help me to be able to bring this together to sort of talk to you about what meditation really sits in all of this. And also uh, Monash, my um, university, for all of the financial support uh, that they've given me um, over the years. So thank you, everybody. I wish you all very well. A wonderful initiative. And I, I look forward to, to meeting you all at some stage in some face-to-face um, -face encounter. Thank you. <laughs>